Mohammed Dilwamir had been married for 33 days. A man who lived for his faith, settling down with a devout Muslim wife, was everything he'd ever wanted. Mohammed was a gentle, kind, much-liked man. His new wife was Mahmouda Khatoun, a woman who, like him, had arrived in London from Bangladesh as a child. They got on well, they had similar interests, and they started to look forward to a life together. But less than five weeks after their wedding, the groom was found lying in a pool of blood in the hallway of the marital home. The body was lying there where it had fallen. The paramedics came in, but it was clear that life was extinct. He was quiet, gentle, a hard-working man, and nobody could think of a reason why anybody would want to murder him. What lay behind the ugly murder of a man just married and who seemed to have no enemies in the world? Summer 2007, a hot, sunny day in bustling Bethnal Green, East London. Mohammed Dilwa Mia marries Mahmouda Khatoun in a marriage arranged by their families. 150 guests attend the wedding. Everyone who knew Mia spoke of a quiet, unassuming man who lived for his marriage, his work and his faith. She likes him, he's a nice guy, and so she agrees to get engaged to him because she sees him as a safe bet and somebody that she hopes in the end she'll grow to love. Fast approaching 30, it was time for both of them to settle down, perhaps to think about starting a family. He was in his late 20s, and the pair seemed a really good match. Both on paper and in practice, they got on well, they had similar interests, and they started to look forward to a life together. Born in Bangladesh, Mahmouda Khatoun had moved to London with her family at the age of six. Her father was a respected local religious leader, but she and her siblings had been allowed to lead a relatively Western life. Mahmouda had attended a local girls' school before studying business at college, but she was soon to discover that that didn't mean she was free from the expectations of her family and community. When she was about 21, she was married by arrangement to a man that her family had chosen for her. The marriage was not a success. Mahmouda claimed that her new husband was both physically and psychologically abusive towards her, and for his part, he claimed that Mahmouda never instigated any affection or responded to him in any way during their marriage. He claimed that Mahmouda made no effort with the marriage and always seemed to be going home to her family or chatting on the telephone with her friends. There was no love. She had no feelings for her husband. And in fact, the frustration that she felt in that marriage boiled over. Her husband became very angry with her, felt that she wasn't being an obedient wife, and he beat her. She complained to her family about the marriage. She wanted out. She tolerated the abuse for a period of time, and eventually she managed to persuade her mum and dad that she should have a divorce. With great reluctance, they agreed. Freed from the shackles of a loveless marriage, Mahmouda found herself living the life of a single, independent young woman once again. Life was good. For several years after the end of her first marriage, she had her freedom. She was able to complete her education, to get qualifications, and lead an independent existence as far as she could with a really interesting job. Soon after, Mahmouda moved out of the family home and into a place called Fidelis House in Liverpool Street, which was a, a hostel designed for people waiting for local authority housing. She was a working young woman in London. Things were going really well by this point. Mahmouda had started working in an optician's as an optician's assistant. Her career was going well. She was promoted to branch manager. This was all Mahmouda had ever wanted, the opportunity to choose her own path. She'd been a girl brought up with expectations, expectations that she'd be a good Muslim girl, that she would be dutiful to her parents, that she'd be obedient and loyal to her family but she wanted something else from her life. 
The single life wasn't to last. Her parents, deeply religious Bangladeshi Muslims, had other plans. As the years passed, her parents again prevailed upon her and said to her that she couldn't remain as a divorcee in their community, that eventually she would have to settle down with someone from a similar background. Her parents began looking again for a, another husband. They really wanted her to settle down, perhaps start a family. The women who are growing up in strict Muslim culture, it's incredibly powerful to have your parents wanting you to marry somebody because essentially you think of the world in a community context. Making sure that you don't bring shame on your family is very powerful. And for a while she was able to persuade them to hold off. They weren't going to force Mahmouda into anything. This was a, an arranged marriage, but by no means a forced one. In fact, Mahmouda was able to reject six or seven potential suitors. Eventually, Mahmouda was introduced to Mohammed Dilwamiya, known to his friends as Amin. He was a quiet, hard-working man who worked as a kitchen porter at a casino on an upmarket street in London's West End. Like Mahmouda, he'd been born in Bangladesh. The youngest of four children, he'd come to the UK in his teens, followed a few years later by his older sister, Saida. He prayed five times a day and was a regular worshipper at his local mosque. He was known to be serious and devout. It was said that he had no enemies, quarreled with no one. Meanwhile, friends were confused that Mahmouda Khatoun had agreed to marriage with Amin. Perhaps she simply felt that she could no longer say no to her parents. Time eventually ran out for her and she had to say yes. She did, however, feel some degree of warmth towards Mohammed. He was the best of the bunch, she thought, and she felt that maybe in time she could learn to love him. Mahmouda had agreed to give marriage another go, but was it what she really wanted? Her barrister, Joe Siddow, believes she was responding to overwhelming pressure from the people around her. She made an effort. She realised that she had expectations on her from her family and from the community, and she tried to meet those expectations. She had to settle for something, and he at least seemed to be a person who was going to be kind to her. A dowry of £10,000 was agreed. Amin paid £4,000 to Mahmouda's parents, with the rest to follow. Mahmouda moved her belongings out of her bachelorette pad in Liverpool Street and made the journey two miles east to Amin's flat in Bethnal Green. It was a place he'd redecorated especially to please his new wife. Amin was happy to settle down. He wanted Mahmouda to be happy, and he went to a great deal of effort to make sure that their marriage would work. Mia's employers had paid for them to go on a short honeymoon in Cheshire. Uh, he'd even changed his hours so that he could spend more time with his new bride. But before their wedding gifts were even unwrapped, Amin made a shocking discovery about his new wife. There were complications in the relationship between Mahmouda and Mohammed because she was communicating an awful lot with a man that she worked with, a man called Nasser Hussein. When she was working in an optician's, she met a guy. There was a relationship that developed between them. Mahmouda and Hussein had had text conversations and calls numerous times a day, an average of 10 times a day. This contact had carried on right the way up to the wedding and beyond. On Mahmouda's wedding day, she exchanged texts and calls with Nasser Hussain. On her honeymoon, she exchanged texts and calls with Nasser Hussain. And in the 33 days of her marriage to Mohammed, Nasser Hussain and Mahmouda contacted one another 395 times. No one ever knew the full depth but undoubtedly she felt an emotional attachment towards him. If you're texting a male when you're on your wedding day, it means that you have some kind of intense relationship or some attraction to that person. Imagine the way you'd feel. You've got married to somebody else, but you're actually interested in another party. Not perhaps the behavior you would expect of a devoted wife, should we say. Even worse, Mahmouda made little attempt to hide her friendship with Nasser from her new husband. 
He was becoming increasingly perturbed by the numerous late night calls that Mahmouda was making on a hidden mobile phone. In fact, Mia had confronted her about these calls and she'd refused to tell him who she was talking to and why. He'd even said to Mahmouda, look, if, if you're seeing someone, I, I'll be devastated, but I understand, let's, let's call it a day, I'll go back to my family, you go back to yours. He was even prepared to give her that dignity and to end the relationship. But he said Mahmouda wouldn't even talk to him about it. She said, it's my private business, it's none of yours. Why had Mahmouda married Amin when she so clearly was besotted with her workmate Nasser? She's never revealed the answer to that question. Perhaps Nasser didn't fit in with her parents' plans. He was a Muslim, but from a Pakistani background. His family and community would in all likelihood have been unknown to Mahmouda's. Mahmouda had tried every way she could to persuade her family that she should be allowed to pursue her dreams, but they were snuffed out. The family itself was under pressure from the wider community to raise their children in a way that would meet the approval of people who were quite conservative in the East End of London. Mahmouda had no option, she felt. Nasser wasn't the only problem. When Mahmouda married Amin Mir, she tried to give it a go. She made an effort, but within a matter of days, she realized this is a man that she simply couldn't relate to. Mahmouda claimed that Mia had objected to her working and having a, a career. Amin wanted Mahmouda to quit her job, but this was something she was not prepared to accept. He wanted an obedient wife, a woman that would cook and clean from, for him and bring up their children. She wanted balance, she wanted fairness, she wanted a life in which both she and her husband could respect each other. But it was only a few days before she realized that was just a pipe dream. It was clear that in the very short time that the couple had been married, things were already going horribly wrong. But she'd made her choice, she'd married Amin, and now she had to see it through. Mahmouda had no option She'd already failed in one marriage, which means she was a much higher statistic anyway to fail in a second. And there was nothing else that she felt she could do because no second divorce would be accepted. Would Mahmouda learn to put aside her ambitions and her desires? It seemed to be her only choice. It's sad to think that the most important thing for her was finding somebody that she may grow to love because it suggests that she felt that there was no other option. Mahmouda felt tormented about this second marriage. It was a big mistake. She should have said no. Bangladeshi-born Amin Mir thought that he'd found his life partner in his new wife, Mahmouda Khatoum. Their East London wedding was a cause for hope and celebration for both of their families. But just a month into their marriage, Tragedy strikes. The couple had only been married for four weeks when the police were called to a flat in Bethnal Green on the 9th of August. The police received a phone call. She was claiming that she was locked out of her flat, but that she could smell something burning on the stove. She'd left her keys at work, she couldn't get into the flat, and she couldn't get hold of her husband. Worse, she'd looked through the letterbox and seen blood on the walls. Mahmouda contacted her two brothers and told them that she needed their help because she couldn't get into her flat. The brothers came, they tried to help her. When police arrived at Hadley House, Mahmouda was panic-stricken, distraught. Her brothers were almost as distressed. The siblings had apparently just made a horrific discovery that confirmed their worst fears for Amin. This is the story they told. All three looked through the letterbox and they saw Amin's body lying in the hallway, blood soaked. There was blood everywhere. The flat was silent. Mahmouda and her brothers could see that Amin wasn't moving. Arcs of blood covered the ceiling and the walls of the hallway. When the police arrived, they couldn't get through the door either. So they called the fire brigade and they forced the door open. And what they found was Mia dead on the floor with a knife wound. He'd been stabbed once in the chest. The television remote control was near to his hand. 
He'd clearly been disturbed watching television. This was an attack that was brutal and came out of the blue. The body was lying there where it had fallen. The paramedics came in, but it was clear that life was extinct. There was nothing they could do to save his life because he was already gone. A bride for just 33 days, Mahmouda Khatoum was now a widow. It looked like her husband had been taken from her in an act of ferocious violence. The police immediately believe that Katoon is innocent, that she's not a victim, that she is the grieving widow, and she plays the part admirably. She does a really good job. The police had no reason at that stage to suspect that she was behind it. After all, she was a diminutive young woman, and there was nothing about her or history that suggested she had a violent temperament. She has an excellent alibi, and she seems to be an individual who had no reason to kill her husband. So people treat her with real care. The police looked at her as someone who might help their inquiry. They spoke to her about her movements in the last time that she'd seen her husband. She came up with the story that she was elsewhere. She told them she had no idea what had happened or why. She told them that she'd been in Liverpool Street, another part of East London, for some hours before returning to the flat, not being able to get in, and then calling the police. At first, Mahmouda's story seemed to stack up. What she said was that after work, she'd travelled to Liverpool Street and gone to visit a friend at the hostel that she'd moved out of just a few weeks before. To corroborate her story, Mahmouda gave the name of a friend that she said she had been with from half past seven until about half past ten. Katoon's alibi is given by her friend Slava Chima, and what she suggests is that she's been with her the whole evening, an hour at least, which is when the crime was committed. The two had talked for around an hour that evening before Mahmouda had taken a cab back to Bethnal Green to see her husband. According to Mahmouda, she hadn't originally planned to return to her marital home that evening, but then had had a change of heart. She'd been at work until 7pm that day and then had let her mother know that she was planning to go back to the family home and spend the night there. This was something that was not unusual either for her or for the culture that they lived in but her mother had reminded her that it was Mirage night, a special night for prayer, and that she should really be with her husband. Laylat al-Miraj is an annual religious holiday which many Muslims mark with prayers and a shared meal. As a devout man, there was little doubt Amin would want to celebrate such an important day. In fact, when he returned from work that evening at 7.30, he'd gone straight back out to the mosque, returning home just before 9 p.m. So later that evening, she then sends another text message to her brother saying, Mum was right, I should be back with my husband, it's Mirage night, we should be praying together. Mahmouda tells police that she had then bid goodbye to her friend Slava and taken a taxi from Liverpool Street to Bethnal Green. On arriving at Hadley House, she realised that she didn't have her keys. And that was when her alleged nightmare had begun. She couldn't get into the flat that she shared with her brand new husband. She couldn't get hold of him on the phone. The door was locked and what was worse, she could smell burning. She was in fear for her husband's life. When the police entered the flat, they found Mahmouda's husband, Mohammed, lying dead on the floor. And it's then that she enters into this play acting of the distressed widow. Detectives were baffled. They couldn't find anyone with a bad word to say about Mohammed Amin Mir, let alone someone with an axe to grind. Everybody appeared to have the same opinion of Mohammed. He was quiet, gentle, a hard-working man, and nobody could think of a reason why anybody would want to murder him. The police were left scratching their head. He was an upstanding member of the community, Mia, who regularly prayed at the local mosque, helped out in the community, had a good job, got on well with friends and family, neighbours. The door was locked. Who on earth could have done this terrible thing to a man who seemingly had no enemies? Often in murder investigations, the first person to be questioned is a victim's spouse the person closest to him or her. They'd want to know whether she was at home, whether she heard anything, whether there was any problem that her husband had with any third party. Mahmouda had clearly anticipated their questions. She had an answer for everything. 
But Peter Blexley, a former detective with London's Metropolitan Police Force, knows only too well that a good copper takes nothing at face value. There's the ABC of detective world. A, accept nothing. B, believe nothing. And C, challenge everything. But despite Mahmouda's convincing portrayal as the grief-stricken widow, something didn't add up with her story. The police eventually did challenge her story, and that, of course, is when it started to unravel. New bride Mahmouda Khatoun tells detectives that she's devastated by the murder of her husband Amin Mir, just 33 days after their wedding. She also tells them that she has no idea who would want to kill him or why. Perhaps she thought getting away with murder would be easy. Eventually, the police asked her for her mobile phones and she handed them over. And perhaps naively, she hadn't understood that the mobile phones would tell a story of their own. One of those phones had been used almost exclusively to contact just one number, that of Nasser Hussein. The young man Mahmouda met working at the opticians and with whom she had developed a relationship. For investigators, this was the first red flag. This dedicated wife, now a grieving widow, had for months been in continuous contact with another man. This contact had carried on right the way up to the wedding and beyond. Even on Mahmouda's wedding day, she had contacted Hussein. And while she was on honeymoon, there was clearly more to this friendship than Mahmouda's new husband was aware of. With this discovery, police believed they had uncovered the motive for Mahmouda Khatoun to kill her husband. But where was the proof? At that point, they had nothing to link her with the crime. She seems to have a really exceptional alibi. Mahmouda denied any involvement in her husband's murder. She stuck to her defense that she'd been nowhere near the flat and that the first time she'd arrived in Bethnal Green had been just before midnight when she called the police. But as police continued to dig into Mahmouda's mobile phone records, they uncovered a fascinating picture of her movements that night. The evidence they found on those phones completely dismantled Mahmouda's alibi that she'd been in Liverpool Street for hours before arriving at the flat. And it was discovered through cell site analysis that the phones had moved in a way that brought Mahmouda very close to the place of the murder at the time that it had happened. One of these phones actually pinged at a mast right by that flat. Her false story was beginning to unravel. The police interviewed Slava again, the friend who lived at Fidelis House, who had been so adamant that she'd spent the evening talking to Mahmouda. She confessed. She said she'd lied in her first statement to the police and that they had only been together for a few minutes as opposed to the hours that Mahmouda had claimed. She was quick to point out that she hadn't done this through any desire to cover up a crime. She had firmly believed that Mahmouda was innocent and was trying to help out her friend by providing her with an alibi. Her alibi not stacking up. Detectives had to piece together exactly where Mahmouda had been that evening and what she'd been doing. At 10.30 p.m., having exchanged messages with her mother about Mirage night, she texted her husband. She says, I'm coming over, don't go to sleep. According to Mahmouda's first account to the police, at that point, she'd taken a cab from Liverpool Street to Bethnal Green, arriving at Hadley House around 11 o'clock in the evening, only to discover that she couldn't get in. In fact, this wasn't Mahmouda's first trip to her marital home that evening. she traveled there earlier via cab. One of the phones that Mahmouda had handed to the police, detectives found the telephone number of a minicab company that had been called in the hours before Mohammed's murder. She had booked a minicab to take her from Fidelis House to Bethnal Green at 9 p.m., some three hours before the time she allegedly arrived at the house to discover that her husband had been murdered. Mm. 
they traced the minicab driver and he said he'd taken a fare, a woman from Liverpool Street, to the flat that Mahmouda and Mohammed shared wearing a burqa. Her face was visible, but she was dressed head to toe in a burqa. Later on, it would be argued in court that it was this very burqa that she used to conceal the murder weapon. She doesn't ordinarily wear a burqa, but to disguise herself, to carry a knife, to get to the flats without being seen on CCTV in a recognisable way, she uses her religion to cover her tracks. CCTV shows a vehicle of the same type as the minicab that had been booked by Mahmouda arriving at the flat at Bethnal Green just before 9pm. They examined the fob key that allowed her entry into the council block and they figured out that the time that it was used last was very close to the time of the killing. She'd claimed that she'd left her keys at work, but she still had her key fob, and when the police tried to force entry, they used this same fob to access the exterior door to the property. In this way, they were able to confirm, beyond all reasonable doubt, that that was Mahmouda's key fob that was used at 9pm to access the property. Police were able to build a timeline of Mohammed Amin Mir's final moments. Returning from prayers at the nearby mosque, he used his key fob to enter the main door at Hadley House at 8.57 p.m. Mahmouda was already waiting. She had entered the flats just one minute before at 8.56 p.m. She used her key fob to access the exterior door of the property. And then it seems she waited somewhere between the exterior door and the flat itself. That's the moment at which she called her husband to see where he was. That call, lasting 24 seconds, was made at 9.06 p.m. It was the last call Amin ever took. Very soon after she accessed the main flat building, her husband's key fob was used. At this point now, Mahmouda has her husband where she wants him, in the flat where nobody can see them. She went up to the floor where the flat was and knocked on the door. Her husband came to the door unsuspectingly. And when he opened the door, within a matter of seconds, she had plunged a knife straight into his heart. He bled to death in the hallway of their home. She left the flat and threw the knife away. At 9.38 p.m., Khatoun called another cab and returned to Liverpool Street. Mahmouda then began the final part of her charade. She texts her husband, a man she already knows is lying in a pool of his own blood. She says, I'm coming over, don't go to sleep. How callous must you be to set up an alibi in that way? She takes a final cab back to Bethnal Green and it's at this point that she then embarks on this play acting, this, this role of the bereaved widow that she plays that is convincing enough that the police believe her. Detectives weren't taken in for long. The police became convinced that they'd found their murderer in Mahmouda cartoon. But her lies were no match for technology. And in this case, CCTV, phone records, and the key fob records showed that she was firmly at the scene of the crime. Once the evidential trail took the police directly to Mahmouda Khartoum, they got her back in, this time as a suspect. She was arrested for the murder of her husband. When she got into the interrogation with the police, she closed up. She refused to answer questions. The police put the evidence to her, but she had nothing to say in response. And on the 20th of September 2007, Mahmouda was charged with murder and remanded in custody. She continued to stick to her defence and wouldn't give any more information until the following year when her case was prepared for trial. The circumstantial evidence against Mahmouda was substantial, but was it enough to convict her of murder? Only two people knew exactly what had happened in the hallway of Mahmouda and Amin's flat, and one of them was dead. Whilst she sat in her prison cell, probably poring over the considerable evidence that was against her, I suspect she decided, I better come up with a defence that will fit 
the circumstances. In certain domestic violence situations, we know that women and men have killed their partners defending themselves. A few weeks before the murder trial is due to start, Mahmouda changes tack. She now says, yes, I did kill him, but says that she was subjected to a torrent of physical and verbal abuse. When I first met Mahmouda Khartoum, it was in a women's prison. Joe Sidhu, a lawyer experienced in defending those accused of the most serious crimes. As one of her lawyers, I felt a measure of sympathy for her. When I saw her in prison, she looked like a broken young woman. She was tearful, she was upset, she was withdrawn. It was almost as though the whole world had come in on her, and there was nothing more that she could do. Circumstantial evidence was stacked against Mahmouda. Her phone records, CCTV, eyewitness accounts, records from the electronic entry door to the flats where she lived with her husband. All showed she'd been in or near the flat when he was brutally stabbed to death. Was there anything Mahmouda Khatoun could do to persuade a jury that she wasn't guilty? At her trial, Mahmouda accepted that she had lied to the police and given a false alibi. She told the jury it was because she was frightened she was panicking. She didn't know what else to do. Mahmouda said that she'd been the victim of prolonged abuse from her new husband, and that on the night of the 9th of August, she had decided to tell her husband that she was leaving him. She couldn't put up with this abuse any longer. She went to the flat to tell him that she was going to leave him, and she was going to pack her bags and disappear. She told the jury that, in fact, on the night that she killed her husband, she was indeed inside the flat. That he had come home, that he'd been shouting at her, he'd been swearing at her, he'd been abusing and insulting her, that she'd try to fight her corner and tell him that she'd stand up for herself. She said Mohammed got violent and repeatedly punched her. Mia had lunged at her and in desperation, Mahmouda claimed to have grabbed a knife from the block on the side in the kitchen. She didn't want to use it. She'd never held a knife in that fashion before. She'd never hurt anyone in her life before. She said that she held a knife at waist level in an underhand grip, telling him, please, stay away. He wouldn't listen. She said that in fear, she backed away towards the front door, still holding the knife. Mohammed approached her. She was frightened, and he kind of walked onto the knife. It impaled him on that knife, it went straight through to his heart. She realized immediately what had happened because the blood was gushing out. She ran out of the flat and disappeared into the night. She turned and fled the flat, having no idea that her husband had died. Mahmouda suddenly cut a sympathetic figure to the jury. It was no ordinary trial. Her brother came to court. He gave evidence about their upbringing and their childhood. It came out, as I asked him questions, that when she was a young girl, she'd been forced to attend Quranic teaching classes where she was beaten if she got even one word wrong. It upset him greatly, and he felt an enormous amount of sympathy for his sister. This was what the jury were being asked to believe. At 21, she was pushed into an arranged marriage with a man she accused of being abusive. At 28, she again succumbed to marrying a man she felt little affection for, one who she would claim in court was also violent and controlling. She said in an interview, it's as though history is repeating itself. There was a defense in law to her act. It could be that she might be found guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility or provocation. It was a convincing tale, but the prosecution immediately set about picking holes in Mahmouda's story, starting with the character assassination of Amin. There was no evidence whatsoever that she'd suffered abuse at Amin's hands. On the contrary, he'd been keen to make the marriage work. Mohammed was a gentle, kind, much-liked man. During the court case, one of the witnesses was the local imam. He said that Mia had been to see him to explain that he was deeply unhappy in this new marriage. 
He said that his wife Mahmuda refused to talk to him, that when he came to sit down next to her, she'd stand up and move to another chair. She wouldn't eat the food he prepared. And he said that she refused his sexual advances and in fact, that the marriage had never been consummated. Her claim that she'd accidentally stabbed Amin while defending herself also failed to stand up to scrutiny. She'd claimed that Mia had assaulted her and that was what had provoked her to grab the knife. But there was no evidence of a physical injury on Mahmouda. There was no medical evidence to support the claims that Mohammed had punched her that night. In fact, pathology and scene of crimes reports seemed to contradict much of Mahmouda's story. The pathologist's report revealed that considerable force had been used to inflict the single stab wound that had killed Mia. The knife had penetrated some 14 centimetres, going through the cartilage of the ribs, through the heart and into the left lung. He died instantly. Arterial splatters across the hallway showed that it would have been a matter of seconds. It would have been impossible for Mahmouda not to have known that her husband had died the very second the knife entered his body. Then there was the murder weapon. Mahmouda's claim that she grabbed a knife from the block on the side in the kitchen simply didn't stack up. There was no knife missing from the block. And to this day, the murder weapon hasn't been found. Far from being a spontaneous and desperate act of self-defense, Mahmouda's every move that night seemed calculated to tell a certain story, one that placed her far away from the marital home at the moment her husband had been killed. There was clearly a high level of premeditation to Katoon's crime, not only because she disguises herself in the burqa, that she goes out and makes sure that a friend covers her tracks. She asks Slava to tell anyone who might ask that they've been talking for at least an hour. She gives the appearance of someone that has been there all evening. So the whole premeditation, then the acting around the events afterwards demonstrate that she absolutely knew what she was doing, why she was doing it, and intended to do it. Mahmouda gave evidence on her own behalf. She was cross-examined by a highly experienced prosecutor, a Queen's counsel, who knew exactly what her weak points would be. He exploited those weak points, as rightly he should, because that was his duty. But the result of it was that she stood there in the witness box, broken and fragmented. But the jury were not to be fooled. They saw through all of this. They looked at the evidence, and that was compelling. Mahmouda was quite rightly found guilty of murder, and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 17 years. A month into their marriage, Amin Mia and his bride Mahmouda Khatoun should still have been enjoying the first exciting phase of a new relationship. Though they weren't in love, Mahmouda had felt enough affection for Amin to agree to the wedding, telling her brother she liked him and thought that he liked her. It was a fresh start for Mahmouda, who'd been under pressure for many years to settle down. For Katoon, basing the relationship on thinking that she might grow to love her partner was going to be something that always failed because what we know about relationships is you at least need some physical attraction, some compatibility, personality traits that really do connect. Not only that, but Mahmouda seemed to be harboring intense feelings for another man, one she was not at liberty to marry. Katoon was clearly motivated by her feelings for somebody else. She believed that if she could get her new husband out of the way, this would mean that she was cleared to go and be with the person that she had feelings for. She's clearly a woman who's a victim of circumstance. In her culture, there is a strong possibility that she felt completely trapped. She didn't feel that she could be with the lover that she wanted. She didn't want to be in a marriage that she didn't ever choose. So the chances are that that enabled her to start having these ideas about how to escape. The tale of Mahmouda cartoon is the tale of many young women from her background who feel that they haven't been able to enjoy freedom in the same way as other people from this country. But their tales don't often end up in a tragedy like this. But what of her victim? The quiet, pious man that she murdered in cold blood and then accused of being violent and abusive? 
Katoon tries to play the victim card because she genuinely thinks there is a chance that this innocent man who has been murdered by her can be seen to be the predator and abuser. And that's even more disrespectful because this man was completely innocent. And yet now, after she's murdered him brutally, she wants to paint him as the abuser. If Mahmouda's only defense had been, I'm trapped in this marriage, I can't escape, murder is the only option, I wouldn't have had any sympathy for her then because you can always walk out of the front door and go to a solicitor and start divorce proceedings. Nobody has the right to take another person's life. She had no right, she's now in jail, and that is where she belongs. No matter what your situation, no matter how dreadful your experience, to push yourself past the moral compass that means that you can go ahead and murder a defenseless, unarmed, compassionate partner shows that there is something broken within your psyche. She was cold, she was callous, she didn't care about the harm that she inflicted on him and she didn't care that when she had murdered him, she tried to sully his name. Without doubt, that suggests a psychopathic personality disorder. Mahmouda wanted to find a way out, and in desperation she thought, how could she get out of this marriage? Eventually, she came to a decision that would determine the rest of her life and end the life of her husband. Mahmouda Khatoun was found guilty by a majority verdict of the premeditated murder of her husband, Mohammed Dilwami, known to those who loved him as a mean. She was sentenced to at least 17 years in prison, and will not be eligible for release until 2025.